is the holy word of light Who is the vision to our eyes Who is the love that will abide Only Jesus Only Jesus Who is true is life Welcome to Village Church Online. My name is Chris and I'm one of the pastors here at Village Church and I wanna make sure you have the best online experience of church possible. To do that, I wanna give you a couple tips. The first is this, get rid of the kids. No, seriously, we have a full online kids program for your kiddos ages two all the way up to grade five at thisisvillagechurch.com. There's a button right there, you can click, get them set up. So as your service is live, theirs will be too. The second is we'd love for you to actually invest in what's happening in the ministry here at Village Church to help other people become Become fully devoted followers of Jesus. We have seen engagement from all around the globe and it's only because of your support we can make that possible. So thank you and we'd love for you to continue giving. You can give online at thisisvillagechurch.com slash give or you can also just text Village Church to 77977 on your mobile device. Finally, we would love if you have any moment in time in, during the service or during the worship where you feel like God is calling you to step into relationship with someone else in prayer. We have live people who are standing by to pray with you today. You can find a live prayer button just under the chat box on your screen. And at any point in the service or before or after, you can click on that button and one of our people will be right there with you to pray through anything that you feel like you might need prayer in. And two big things that are going on. The first is online baptisms. You heard me right, online baptisms. We wanna give you the opportunity to observe the sacrament of baptism. That means if you believe in Jesus Christ, if you have a relationship with him, then the next step is to get baptized. And if you haven't taken that step, the time is now. It might look different. It might look creative, but we'd love to join you in that. So head to thisisvillagechurch.com and click on the baptism link where you can register for and be baptized even in a time like this. And finally, don't go through any of this alone. We offer community groups all around the world at this point in time. And not only can you join a group, you can actually begin to facilitate a group from your home, no matter where you are. We would love for you to take that step. You can head to thisisvillagechurch.com slash groups to find out more information and get connected like never before. We're so glad you joined us. Why don't we continue in today's service?
Hey, Village Church, Pastor Mark here. Really glad that you're part of this. And hopefully you are joining community groups during the week as we unpack uh, what we're talking about deeper and deeper. And uh, glad that you are part of this global family, this national family. And we have a ton of you that have become part of Village Church since this whole thing went down across Canada. And uh, of course, globally, about 127 countries watching, which is awesome. So welcome to all of you. But I have a special word. Of course, globally, it's gonna be relevant. But to Canada in particular. I just want to kind of focus as we come around Psalm 19. It's a crazy psalm. It's an unbelievable psalm. It's a psalm that unpacks kind of an apologetic, and that's, that's the, the word for a defense of, an apologetic for God and for the Bible and for us. And so we're going to be hitting a bunch of stuff today, probably more like a uh, less uh, a preaching and more a teaching, less a sermon and more almost like a lecture. So hopefully you got your hats on. We're going to hit a bunch of data and ask some really big questions today because that's where this psalm leads us. But specifically, I just want to kind of call out Canada uh, in this message. And what I mean by that is um, about five to six percent of Canadians say that they're actually evangelical Christian. Uh, and most most, that means most of Canada, 95, 94% of Canada doesn't believe in Christianity, is actually pretty opposed to it. In fact, there was a, uh, uh, a magazine, McLean's Magazine, which is a kind of a national Canadian magazine that did a survey a little bit ago. And what they found was that um, uh, about 30% of Canadians said that they're most uncomfortable around evangelical Christians. Uh, that was actually the same level as drug addicts and child abusers. They were uh, almost the same level uncomfortable with Christians as they were drug addicts and child abusers. So let me just say something Canada, all right? Uh, th th I just want Canada to kind of focus in here for a second as this secular post-Christian culture. Um, I want to call you out a little bit on that because I don't think you're really paying attention. And I think Psalm 19 has a special word for you in regard to a defense of what God is trying to do in your life. Um, because I think part of uh, the mentality of Canadians is they say, I don't want to believe in Christianity. I don't want to believe in Jesus because my spouse doesn't, my friends don't, my coworkers don't, and it's for dumb people. It's old fashioned. It's silly. And I'm smarter than it. And Psalm 19 is going to come out of the gate and say, actually, you're wrong. That God is hunting you down. He loves you. And he's put some stuff in creation to actually hunt you down, to go, I want you to know me. I've revealed myself to you. Every time you look at a snow tip mountain, every time you look at a, a baby being born, every time you study DNA through a, through a microscope, every time you hear beautiful music, it's me hunting you down. I've put literally, I've put breadcrumbs down in creation in order to draw you to myself. Like a kid, my kid, in order to get my dog to go sleep in her bedroom, she'll literally put dog bones down, little treats, and it'll be like, boom, 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 all the way up to her bedroom. So the dog falls up, boom. God, this Psalm is about to say, this is exactly what God has done in creation and through the scriptures. He's revealed himself. So if you take a systematic theology class um, and you enter, and there's the first thing you learn is revelation, not the book of revelation, but revelation, meaning God has revealed himself. And there's two ways that it's done. There's general revelation and there's special revelation. This text, Psalm 19, the one we're about to do, literally hits both of them and says, God has revealed himself in general revelation and special revelation, meaning the scriptures, and it defends it and says, he's done all this to draw you to yourself. So here's what I want to challenge you. You got to open yourself up to this, that God might be hunting you down. You've got to allow yourself to be open to something that don't just say, well, my life's decided because God might be actually drawing you to something amazing. So let's start it this way. Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. So he literally starts out the heavens, like the sky, the, the stars, the clouds, they declare the glory of God. And the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech and night to night reveals knowledge. There's no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them, he set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens and it's circuit to the end of them and there is nothing hidden from its heat. Right out of the gate, the psalmist David goes, God built the universe and the point of it is it's speaking. 
It's revealing God to you as a person. The, the, the stars, the clouds, the sky, it's all built in order to speak of, not of the glory of the stars in the sky or you, it's actually speak, he says, of the glory of God. And so um, I, I went to the top of Whistler. I was snowboarding there a little bit ago and I'm sitting at the top of Whistler and I'm looking out at all these unbelievable snow tip mountains and I'm like, man, there's something else right? This beautiful carvings out. You just feel so small, the vastness. This is what he's talking about. You go and look at, you start studying the things of nature. This is God in nature speaking to us. Go on YouTube and watch um, something called the battle at Kruger. All right. There's like this, um, there's this like little water buffalo. All right. And it's in like a, like a, a reservation, and he's walking along near this swamp, and he's going chilling out, and he's like, hey, he's licking at the water, and this lion comes out of nowhere, and this pack of lions comes to this little water buffalo, and it's like, oh man, this thing's dead. They grab him, they put him in the water, they're trying to kill him, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, it's like the greatest drama you've ever seen, this crocodile comes up and grabs a water buffalo, and they start going back and forth with between this pack of lions and this crocodile trying to get this water buffalo for food. And that goes on for like three or four minutes. You're like, oh my gosh, this water buffalo is dead. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, his whole family, like literally a hundred water buffalo, just like come roaming around. And they're like, what's up, player? And they like totally chase off these lions, chase off these crocodiles. It's the craziest drama you've ever seen. And you're sitting there, you're watching, you're going, creation's crazy. Like, I'm in awe of the specialty of it, of the design of it, of the kind of stuff that goes on. And if you're actually exegeting the world right, then you're beginning to realize that God is actually speaking to you through creation. This is precisely the point of Paul in Romans chapter one. Here's what he argues in Romans chapter one. He goes, uh, for what can be known about God is plain to them, verse 19, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made so they are without excuse. So literally, God is speaking to you through what is made. He's speaking to you through creation itself, through the skies, through the, look what he says about the sun. He's like, in them, he set a sun for the tent, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber. You know what he's talking about? Like a groom who's just married this girl and they go into their marriage chamber and they consummate and the dude walks out and he's just like beating his chest jacked up. He's spreading, he's hot. He's the man, he's in control. He's like, what's up? I just got married, consummate, legit coming out of the chamber. And David goes, that's literally what the sun is like every time it rises. It's like a new groom just coming out of his chamber. Like, what's up, players? This is creation in control saying, look at how small you are. Look at how amazing, look at, this is like, so every time you see the sunrise, that's totally now ruined, you know, all of your pictures. Every time you think of the sunrise, just picture a newly married dude coming up, what's up, man? All right, that's literally what it's like. And the Bible's going, this is creation. And it's trying to talk to you. This is the voice of creation. This is God's self-disclosure to humankind. And here's the beautiful thing about it. God didn't have to reveal himself. He chose to, you never could have found him, but he built it into creation. And so uh, a theologian, P.T. Forsyth says this, the God of the Bible is not discovered. He is not forced into the light by any power outside of himself, not even our misery. That he chose to reveal himself. That the heavens declare of the glory of God. So every time you're looking up at the sky, this is every time the sun rises, you know what it's saying? It's saying God's giving you another chance. And first Peter tells us the reason he does that is so we repent. And so he raises the sun, he sets the sun so that you would come to know Jesus. Your days aren't just days that are fluctuating back and forth. This is God preaching to us. Now, here's the thing: there's about three or four arguments that theologians and philosophers and scientists recognize when they think of creation, what's called natural theology, to, to, to point to the evidence for the existence of God. So I know some of you uh, who watch this, you're skeptics, you're new, you're exploring Christianity. We're so glad that you're part of our church and, and part of these services. So let me give you two or three things that I think are going on here as he's talking about creation, actually preaching the existence of God. 
Uh, the first is what's called the cosmological argument. Um, Francis Collins, who's the scientist, puts it this way. He's talking about how the universe, nothing that begins to exist, um, everything that begins to exist has to have a cause. We know that. So everything that begins to exist has to have a cause. So all the philosophers through a time said, well, the universe is the one thing that never began to exist because we know that everything that begins to exist has to have a cause. That would mean God exists. So we're just gonna argue that the universe was eternal. And that was fine until the 1930s when we realized that no, actually the universe is expanding and that all time, energy, matter came into existence at a particular moment. Here's, what Francis, uh, here's how Francis Collins explains it. We have a very solid conclusion that the universe had an origin, the Big Bang. 15 billion years ago, the universe began with an unimaginably bright flash of energy from a small point. There was nothing before that. Nature couldn't have created itself. The universe had a beginning, and that implies that someone was able to begin it, that someone had to be outside of nature. So here's the Apostle Paul. He's saying, you're a skeptic, you might want to look at the universe itself and realize that it's pointing to a mind outside of itself that existed before it that actually created. That's where the evidence goes, right? We as Christians want to follow the evidence. We want to follow the evidence of the natural world. Where is it actually leading us? Even if you look at the reality of design, you look at the fact that in a single celled amoeba, you have 30 encyclopedias of information, DNA, coding, language. Now, as William Pele years ago talked about, um, if you're walking along a beach and you came across a rock, you might look at the rock and go, okay, hey, there's a rock, nothing to that. But if you came across a watch and you open up the watch or in our day, uh, an iPad, and you cracked open the back of it, you realize it had intricate design with purpose and kind of, uh, you'd say, oh, somebody made this. And so when you look around at the universe and you see the way it functions and you see the coding and you see everything about it, science, the deeper it delves into these things, starts to realize that the evidence is actually pointing toward theism, toward God rather than away from him. And so God himself has set creation up as a natural thing to preach at us. You don't need a preacher. Remember last week we talked about the idea, what if I disappeared? All right, so what if I disappeared this week? What if the internet disappeared this week? What would you need? There was a, a story I was reading in the French Revolution. Government comes to this peasant and he goes, I know you believe in God. I know you believe in Christianity, but here's the thing. We're gonna burn down all your steeples. We're gonna take all your churches. We're gonna kill them. We're gonna take all your cathedrals. We're gonna burn them because then you have no memory of this ridiculous superstition that you believe in. And the peasant's response was this. The problem is you can't do anything about leaving us the stars. This is what he's talking about. God has given, I, churches disappear, internet disappears, pastors disappear. You got the stars, bro. You got the heavens declaring the glory of God and preaching a sermon at you every single day. You have nature itself saying, here is the loving God who has revealed himself. He didn't stay hidden. He decided to reveal himself to you. So the question is, what do we do with that? Right, and so creation, cosmology. Now you can choose to follow the evidence or choose to deny it for lots of different reasons. I've told you this story before about my grandfather who was, uh, my brother and I tracked him down and he seemed to have been abducted by these people who were kind of just taking his money and had him in the house and just waiting for him to die and, and basically emptying his bank account to pay for their own house. And we thought we were gonna go in and tell him the truth and he was gonna leave with us because he didn't know. And so the reality is we went in, we said, okay, we're gonna tell him the truth. He's gonna go because the truth will set you free. And we sat him down and we said, hey, you people leave. And we looked at him, he said, they're, they're taking your money. We gotta get out of here. And he said, I know they're taking my money, but I don't wanna leave here. Why? Because I get three square meals a day. And sometimes the truth isn't enough. There's other agendas. There's things behind the thing. Some people don't want to be free. And that's my fear with you. I left and I went, okay, my grandfather actually doesn't want to come and base his life on truth. He'd rather sit and get three square meals a day and have conversation. And it's the pleasure of this moment that's actually going to overcome the truth. And my fear is that many of you are making decisions based on your aesthetical value, your impulse toward pleasure versus your impulse toward running after the evidential reality of the universe. Psalm 19 is calling you out, saying, Canada... What's the thing behind the thing? The, the, the glory of God is seen in what is created. It's preaching at you. He's wooing you. 
with love every single day. And what are you choosing to do about it? Even the way that science has been telling us, look, this actually makes sense. It, the universe actually, the math suggests that the universe came into existence in such a way that without a mind directing it, it never would have actually happened by mathematical reality. Like, so, so one, one uh, scientist says this, the world in its unity and harmony and in the organization of all of its creatures exhibits a purpose which chance does not explain, but which instead points to a mind. So scholars say that the chances of our existence ever happening in the universe existence ever happening is one chance in 10 to the 138th power, which is a crazy big number where this never could have actually taken place. It's almost creepy how much the universe seems set for human life. It's put this far away from the sun so it doesn't burn up, but just far enough away in the sense that it doesn't freeze. It's built on an axis so that you have seasons and things can grow. Every single piece of it, the chances are so mathematically absurd that the Bible's just going, I want you to actually follow the evidence. So Richard Swinburne, who's a philosopher, very respected philosopher, he says this, the very success of natural science in showing us how deeply ordered the natural world is provide strong grounds for believing there is an even deeper cause for that order. So the question is, what is the purpose of all this cause? Why does everything seem intricately designed? Why does the universe work? It shouldn't even work. That's the question that's got to keep you up at night if you choose to reject a theistic worldview, a worldview that says God exists. Now, Let's bring this down to brass tacks and the reality that we're living through right now. You have anxiety, right? You're stressed. We're all stressed about stuff. We don't know what the future is going to go. We don't know where this is going to go. Do you want to know why you're stressed? Partly because of the worldview that you live out of. See, here's the problem with the secular worldview we've created in Canada. The church is behind. That's old fashioned. We don't need God anymore. We're just going to progress. We're going to do our thing. We're going to live our life. We're going to create all the problems. We're going to do progress and technology and education. You know what happens? We, in that worldview, get an inflated view of humankind and what it can produce. That is why the major theme of our culture is anxiety. Because without God, you're in control of it and it bears down a burden and a weight on you. And this Psalm's going, you gotta give that over to the God who's actually in control of all things. The other evidence to this thing in creation is take the creatures, human beings. The fact that you and I, there's a consciousness of humankind that we have of a supreme being. Sociologists tell us that every culture you go to has some kind of transcendent view. They don't just look around and say, well, this is it. Every single culture, no matter how primitive, has some kind of religious expression. Why? Because they look up at the stars, the heavens declare the glory of God, the sky above proclaims his handiwork. It's preaching. And so they come up with some version of religion. This is what sociologists tell us all human tribes through all human uh, experience is done. Why? Because there's something innate in our consciousness that connects when we look up at the stars and we look up at creation that says there's something behind this. And uh, okay, so remember a couple weeks ago, I told you the story about Jim Elliott. Jim Elliott went to Ecuador. Uh, he was a missionary and went to this, this tribe, uh, the Wayadani tribe, the warriors. And he told them about, he was going there to tell them about Jesus and he got killed. Him and his uh, missionary uh, friend, Nate Saint. So he was killed by a guy named Micaiah. And uh, this was in 1956. And this week, Micaiah died. Um, how we know that is because two years after Nate Saint and Jim Elliott were killed by him, um, the families actually made peaceful entry into that tribe, became friends with Micaiah and his family, and Micaiah gave his life to Jesus. He spent the rest of his life traveling around the world, telling them about Jesus, telling them his own conversion story, to the point where Nate Saint's son actually became like a son to Micaiah. And Nate Saint's son, Steve, writes these words. I have known Micaiah since I was a little boy when he took me under his wing and had his sons teach me to blowgun hunt. 
He was one of my dearest friends in the world. Listen to this. Yes, he killed my father, but he loved me and my family. Think about the kind of thing that the God of the universe would have to do in a human soul to be able to turn them into someone who loves somebody else who killed their own father. See, here's what happened with Micaiah. God had spoken to him through creation itself had readied his heart so that when people came in to tell him about Jesus, this was God being exegeted to him, being explained to him. Now, here's what I think is true. I think everything I just said about creation and Micaiah's life is true about your life. God has been hunting you down so much so he's put these experiences and these things in your life just by natural theology. He's done this so that, so that one day you are drawn to him like a breadcrumb that gives their life to Christ. And in this moment, maybe that is that moment for you. That there's things, if you look back on your life, that there's no way chance is actually the, 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 the explanation for this. I was reading a, a book recently and they were talking about how there are 200 million reported signs of miracles in the seven continents of the world in the modern era. Miracles. Now, here's the problem with that. If you're a skeptic, if even one of those is true, your whole world view falls apart. If uh, it only takes one miracle, like a response to prayer, where it was like, this person was this, I prayed and that actually happened. Like there's so many things that happen in the world in our lives that we can just interpret wrong. I was, I was reading a story about um, this church in the States and they had choir practice. And they had 100 church members coming to choir practice and practice started at 7.30. At 7.45, the entire church blew up because of a gas leak. No one died though. Because every single one of them were 16 minutes late. How is that possible? Every one of them had a different reason and experience why they were actually late that day. You know the stories even in your own life. I was talking to a scholar the other day, and this is not my thing at all. I'm just gonna throw this out to you. So this scholar's like well-respected. He's not a charismatic, crazy television evangelist guy, you know, at all. And uh, he's like, yeah, it's really strange. My really trusted friend, who's like the most skeptical guy I know, like super academic, reads footnotes for a living, was dragged to this church service. And it was one of these church services where he was sitting there and he was skeptical of the whole thing. And there was a guy up there preaching and he's like, some of you, blah, blah, blah. And he's sitting there, skeptic with his wife. And, uh, and the guy looks out and, and this guy had a, a sore tooth and he'd had it for like six months. And the guy who was preaching, he's up there with his Bible preaching. He's like, and some of you, you got, you got sore teeth. Someone's got a sore tooth in here, you know? And the guy's like, uh, I'm not doing that. His wife's like, that's you, that's you. You know, he's like, someone's gonna be healed. And uh, he's like, no, no, I'm not saying. So finally his wife, after like 20 minutes, like you get up there. He's like, come on, I, I, I think it's somebody. Finally, guy walks up, he prays for him. He says, nothing happened. He goes home. The next morning he wakes up to brush his teeth. He has a gold tooth. What? Sorry, say that again. <laughs> Like I've never, this is, guys, crazy stuff goes on. And we could sit around. I mean, I, I could tell you story after story of crazy stuff that happens. But the reality is you got to come to a place in your life where you're like, man, is there a God preaching at me right now? Is there a God behind that mountain or is the mountain it? Is the sun in its orbit it? Is that, is that the end of the game? Or did someone create this stuff to actually speak to me? As C.S. Lewis says, we have to recognize that there are those moments where you get that glimmer. And then he says this, you know what that is? That little moment where you were like, maybe there is something. The way he puts it is this. It's the scent of a flower we have not found. The echo of a tune we have not heard. News from a country we have never visited. That's what that is for you. So will you actually follow it? This is why he's saying it actually speaks the glory of God, not the glory of you. Now, here's the other thing. That's general revelation. 
All right, that's the, that's the first big thing that he says, the first big way God actually speaks and reveals himself. The second way is by what theologians call special revelation. And that means that there's only so much you can learn by looking around at creation. So what you actually need is you need uh, more specific information to tell you about sin, to tell you about salvation. That's the second piece of what he says. Look at verse seven. So one to six, that's general revelation. Starting in seven, it's special revelation. It's actually about the Bible. Or as one, uh, one theologian talked about, he said, there's the big book, which is creation in the universe. And then there's the little book, the Bible itself. And then he said, are you reading both? Because you actually need both to figure out what's going on. So he says this, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteousness altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. See, this is why, see, C.S. Lewis back in the day, he was this Oxford professor who, who did medieval poetry and he thought worship music tended to not be good. All right, he said, it's shallow. The poetry is terrible. He said, Psalm 19 is the best poem in the book of Psalms and one of the greatest lyrics in the world. This is partly why. The, the scriptures come like this honeycomb and it's beautiful and it gives life. And so there's all these things about it. He says these things about it. It's, it's perfect, it's sure, it's right, it's pure, it's clean, it's true. All the things that our culture looks at the Bible and says, I don't trust it, I don't like it, it's not true. It's not an Aaron. It's not infallible. See, the New Testament comes, the Bible comes at us and says, the Bible is uh, 2 Timothy 3. It's breathed out by God and it's perfect because it was carried, men were carried along by the Holy Spirit to write it. That's why there's literally no mistakes in your Bible. It's an errant, it's perfect, it's true, it's infallible. Everything it teaches is true. This is why you need to come under its authority because it's going to call you out on just like building a worldview on how you feel in a given moment. The scriptures come and they go, actually, everything I tell you about sin, heaven, hell, salvation, God is actually true versus whatever you feel in a moment. Are you willing to recognize that the scriptures are everything he just said? Perfect, sure, right, pure, clean, true. Do you actually believe that? Now, here's what we do as Canadian culture. We say, I don't want to believe in the Bible. The Bible's a joke. It's old, it's filled with contradictions, it, it's a disaster, it makes mistakes all the time. Listen, I grew up as a skeptic, so I understand what you're saying, and I, and I am sympathetic to your arguments. But here's the thing, after studying the Bible for 20 years, I realized those, bar, those arguments are weak, man. Like, that's classic stuff that's easily proven false. All right, let me, let me give you a couple of examples of this, okay? So in, uh, in Mark chapter one, skeptics that I know look at Mark chapter one and they say, uh, Mark chapter one, there's big mistakes in it. And if you're gonna say the Bible's true, like the Psalm said, it's perfect, then you got a problem because in Mark chapter one, we see a mistake in the first verse, all right? We're gonna put this on the screen for you so you can track what I'm talking about right now. So here's what a skeptic says across the coffee t uh, table from you. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way. Here's what they'd say. Here's the problem. If you want to argue, the Bible's true. The Bible's perfect. The problem is when Mark says, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, he doesn't quote Isaiah. He actually quotes Malachi, which is true. So what do we do about that? It looks like the Bible's filled with a mistake. I'm going to now quote Isaiah. And then he quotes Malachi, or some people say, Malachi, the Italian prophet, All right? So what do we do with this? Did Mark make a mistake? Should we throw our Bible out? Done. Can't trust it anymore. No, here's the beautiful thing about the gospel of Mark. It's so well written. Here's what you got to understand. The commas, the periods, all those little English things aren't part of the original text. And in fact, what scholars point out is that that's not how to read the first verse. What if you read it this way? The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the son of God, as it is written in Isaiah, the prophet, colon, meaning my whole book 
is about Jesus Christ as presented by, by Isaiah the prophet, colon, now I'm going to start my book. And he says, you know, Malachi comes out of the gate. I was going to say Malachi. Adam and Malachi. All right, Malachi comes out of the gate and he starts a quote and then Isaiah and then all these chapters all the way through Mark are actually quotes from Isaiah. He's presenting Jesus in the last half of his book as the suffering servant from Isaiah. It's that the whole gospel of Mark is based on presenting Jesus as a fulfillment of Isaiah. It's not a mistake. He doesn't accidentally quote Malachi thinking it's Isaiah. He's presenting the whole book. Okay, I'll give you another example. In uh, Matthew 13, 31, Jesus says these words. The kingdom of God is like a grain of mustard seed that a man sowed in his field. He uses the Greek word agros, okay? So this is when you go on reddit.com and look up why the Bible's wrong, this is the kind of stuff that comes up. You can't trust the Bible because Mark, you know, misquoted uh, Isaiah. And Matthew says that the kingdom of God uh, it's like he, um, a seed he sowed in his field. But then you take the same story and you read it in Luke 13 and it says this, the kingdom of God like a mustard seed seed that a man sowed in his garden, the word kepos. So did he say field or did he say garden? Luke and Matthew contradict each other. Throw your Bible out. It's garbage. Let's everybody go home. And here's what us in our modern Canadian brains don't realize. What Gerd Thiessen, who's a theologian who studies the life of Jesus, talks about the fact that you understand that Jesus spoke these parables not two times, but 200 times in various locations and at various times. When you bump into a seeming linguistic problem in the gospels, it's because Luke's recording that time that Jesus set it up on this place and it was like December, you know, 31 AD or whatever. And then Matthew's got something going on in the summer of 32. Like these are different times. And all these arguments, people go, no, the Bible's not true. I can't believe you would believe it. You got to understand archaeologists over and over and over again tell us that the statements the Bible makes are actually upheld and legitimate and they're to be trusted. The Bible cares about history. If you doubt that, go read Luke chapter two. Go read some of the, uh, the Christmas story. Uh, there was a census taken when Caesar Augustus well, was, Quirinius was the governor of Syria. <laughs> right? Why does he do all this? He's citing history, territories, geography, historians, people, because the Bible actually cares about history. It cares about being true, not just a fantasy, not just a myth. You can trust it in every archaeological dig after thousands of claims through the Old Testament and New Testament about regions and leaders. It's true, it's true, it's true. Over and over and over again, what he says about the scriptures is actually true. It's powerful. And as Augustine said, this is the face of God for us now. That's why it's on the honeycomb. That's why it's sweet. See, and this is the thing, when, when I became a Christian, listen, there's skeptics that go, you know, Christianity, the problem with it is, is a whole bunch of people sitting around doing group think and they're just influenced by each other and the power structures and they just, they just group think around. That wasn't me. For the first two and a half years of me being a Christian, all I had was the Bible. This is what did its work on my life. This is the thing that actually just totally inspired me. I never sat under a sermon or a preacher for two and a half years. I just sat, smoked a pack of cigarettes, read the New Testament and just did what it said. And I started going around my town telling people about Jesus. They were sitting there getting hammered in the park. You got to give your life to Jesus. I'd baptize them at two in the morning. This is the thing that God used. And this is why I'm looking at you and I'm saying, guys, maybe some of you, you're like church day for me, whatever. I want you to meet God in the special revelation of the scriptures. They're powerful, I'm telling you. Give them a chance. John Bunyan said, this book will either keep you from sin or sin will keep you from this book. You have to ask, what's the reason I'm not willing to actually engage this thing on its own terms? Because as this Psalm says, it's true, it's right. But now it's gotta get personal. And that's the beautiful part. He goes, the drippings of the honeycomb. More to be desired, talking about the law of the Lord. More to be desired is the law of the Lord than gold. 
even much far, even more than money. The words of the Bible are more important than your money, than your house, than your car. If you were given the option today, all this time and energy you put after 30, 40 years of working in mortgage payments, and you could either ever read the Bible again or keep your house, what would you do? He's saying, don't you get it? It's actually more, imp- and see, this is, okay, listen. Um, this is how it becomes personal for you. Um, so I did young adult ministry for a whole bunch of years. And here was the crazy thing that young adults used to do. Hey man, um, so I understand that God wants me to do my sex life like this, but the reality is I kind of want to do it like this. But, or uh, translate it into your life. I, I want to do my business. I know God wants me to run my business like this or my family, like whatever, but I'm going to kind of do it like this because I'm not really sure that the, that the scriptures are actually like the right, you know, I understand what they want me to, but I'm just wondering if I do it my way, will God punish me though? I mean, that's kind of my concern because I know I want to take, I know I want to take it into my own hands, but I just don't want the punishment later. Now here, as one preacher I uh, read years ago talked about, he said, here's why that's a category mistake and really dumb. He says, that's like going up to the top of a building and saying, I'm standing on a building 30 stories in the air and I'm going to jump off. Okay, I'm going to defy, try to defy the law of gravity. But do you think by trying this, I'm going to get a ticket? I don't, because I really don't want to get a ticket. And he says, the problem is, it's not that it's illegal. Listen to me. It's not that it's illegal to defy the law of gravity. It's stupid. It's not that it's a le- You shouldn't be coming saying, but, but, but God, I want to do it my own way, but I'm afraid you're going to punish me. You're going to give me a ticket. You're going to say it's illegal. He's going, don't you understand? My way, it's not about illegal. It's about stupid. It's about, I want you to flourish like we talked about last week and I've got the best way to do it. Are you going to listen? or not listen. This is about your good. I love you so much. Look at what he says. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. What's his point? He's saying, I actually want my heart to change because of this. He's saying, this is actually right and true. Verse nine, the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true. Are you going to build your life on what's true? That's the question. Because the Bible's true and it transcends any moment, any cultural moment that we happen to be in. It's actually better than it. See, this is what he's saying. I want to give you the good life. And if you don't take it, I want you to have some FOMO. That's what he's saying. Right? Some of you are like, oh, I, I, I didn't get invited to that party. God's going, I got a party going. The question is, do you actually want to build your life on something that makes sense? You know, there's this professor at Boston College And he starts his philosophy courses. He's not necessarily a Christian, but he recognizes that you have to care about the worldview you build your life on. So he starts all of his philosophy courses by doing an exam with all these students. And he tells them, I want you to tell me if you believe in absolute moral values or not, like right and wrong. And he says, 96% of them say, no, morality is just subjective. You get to kind of choose whatever you want in life. And so he says, okay, great. He always collects it. And he says, okay, here's the thing. Um, all the women who are taking this course automatically are going to fail. And all the kids are like, what are you talking about? This is the most unfair thing I've ever... And he goes, whoa, whoa, whoa. No, no, no. Don't bring me what's fair. I made up... I feel like it. You're not allowed to project how you feel on me. And he says, see, you, you try to live your life like this, but you can't actually do it. You can't build your life on that foundation. You can't actually live that out at all. So what's he trying to say? The Bible is the thing you build your life on. This, this um, word right here in verse nine, he says, um, the rules of the Lord are true, right? Uh, you, have, you have fundamental morality, right versus wrong. And that's what makes sense and meaning of your life. And then he goes, that, that's good and righteous altogether. That word righteous means uh, a straight edge, like a, like um. Um, it's kind of like a measuring, like if, like I remember this time I was trying to buy this fridge 
Okay, I'll give you this analogy. And I was trying to put it in my house and I, and I knew what the measurement of the gap to put the fridge in, but I didn't, I didn't remember it when I got to the store. So I did it by feel. So I looked at the fridge, I'm like, hmm, yeah, I think that that can actually fit in that hole. That, so I bought the fridge, right? We get the thing home, it's like, tsh, tsh. all I needed was the measuring tape because the measuring tape transcends how I feel and gives me facts. He's saying, what are you gonna actually build your life on? The Bible's gonna give you truth. The world's gonna give you how you feel in a given moment. This is the straight edge that you need. This is the thing that's gonna make you succeed at a soul level, which is exactly what he ends with. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. I want to be acceptable in your sight. How's that ever gonna happen? Here's the beautiful thing about Christianity. We feel the weight, we feel the burden. We feel like, oh man, maybe I can't actually do this. That's how the moralist looks. That's how the religious person looks at the law of the Lord. Looks at it and goes, man, this thing is gonna crush me. I can't actually succeed at being a good person like the law of the Lord tells me to do. And I'm scared and I'm hoping I get before God and one day he's, he just takes it easy on me. You know what the Christian does? He looks at the law of the Lord and goes, I'm not afraid of you because I know one who came and actually obeyed the law of the Lord perfectly in my place. And it's him who I trust. He is, as the psalmist says, my rock and this word here, my redeemer. He's my redeemer. Some of you are actually trying to be righteous in front of God by paying attention to laws and your, the meditation of your actual heart hasn't been converted by Jesus Christ yet, the one who was perfect in your place. And so you're feeling the weight and the burden. As one uh, analogy I read one day said, you don't become a dog by eating dog food. Being a dog is in your DNA. How many of you right now are trying to be a Christian or be acceptable in the eyes of God if you believe in him by doing good things or paying attention to the law of God, thinking that that is gonna be what actually makes you righteous. It's not. It needs to get into your DNA. The only way that happens is by the personal work of Jesus on the cross, in the resurrection, the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. That's the only thing that changes the words of your mouth and the meditation of your actual heart and affections. Let it be acceptable in your sight. This is what I'm pleading, Lord. Let it be acceptable in your sight. Guys, stop trying to dabble in this and be moralist and be a good person because the law of the Lord will crush you. But when you're redeemed in Christ, here's what the law of the Lord pivots to. More desired than gold, sweeter than honey, and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. Both in the, in the present world and in the next, there is great reward when we succeed at following the way God has measured things out for us. Do life like this. That's what's gonna make it fit. That's what's gonna make it work. That's what's gonna make you flourish. You know what the problem is? Some of you are scared in a moment like this. It's because you have no meaning, purpose, value. You look at the law of God and you say, oh, it's a restriction. So there's no freedom. No, 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 listen. The freedom is in the God-ordained restriction because the restriction is under your flourishing. Here's what I mean. I'll pray for you. Um, I used to have this job at a warehouse before uh, my wife and I moved out to BC and it was moving golf clubs around and cleaning the warehouse. One day, me and my buddy Ivor, this guy I met there, he was like this 60-year-old Jamaican man. We used to go in, hang out, have this great time. We loved each other. Went in one day, our bosses look at us, go, hey, look, um, we have actually nothing to do, but we need you to just stay here for eight hours so that we can get the hours and you can get the hours. So just, just stay here. And for eight hours, we just stood in a warehouse, looking at it, each other. I was like, hey, Ivory's like, what to go on? I'm like, all right, 
So what are we doing? Nothing. It was torture. We couldn't wait to get to the warehouse the next day and be given a task. I want you to move those boxes over there. I want you to do this. I want you to do that. Because in that task, in that restriction, there was meaning. There was purpose. There was value. Ergo, there was joy. Without a story that's giving direction, this world is going unto something. Of course, we're going to flounder and be depressed. Of course, we're going to be riddled with anxiety and fear of our neighbors because we have nothing to live for. And this psalm just said, creation is preaching at you, trying to draw you. The scriptures are preaching at you, trying to draw you. And now I want it to actually, all those things to be true in your own heart personally. And the only way that happens is the person, the work of Jesus. Lord, help us to actually respond to the power of this psalm by aligning our hearts and minds across Canada. Let us recognize that people, human beings, have no value and direction unless there is a God in the universe who made them. Our worldviews and the way we live don't even make sense unless we are of value and we are not animals. That the law of the Lord is perfect when it declares on us, we're made in God's image, and we're to be redeemed unto something. And that the ultimate beautiful revelation was you, Jesus, actually showing up and revealing God to us. So that if we believe and trust in you, we are given a kind of quality and reward that we never could have dreamt of. I pray as hearts and minds are listening to this, that they value more than anything, our rock and our redeemer. In your great name we pray, amen.
We are so thankful you joined us today for this online service experience. Beyond this, the call of the church is not just to take in a service every week, but to be the church this week. Wherever God has placed you, be encouraged and be transformed by his spirit moving in your life so that we can see the world change around us and through us. We'll see you next week.